So everyone, uh, welcome back to the second keynote uh, lecture of uh, the 2021 TSC Digital Economics Conference. And today we're very, very happy uh, to have Ekaterina Jurovska um, here. Uh, she is a professor of economics at the Paris School of Economics. And she's written, you know, like a truly staggering and amazing number of, of really great articles about, um, about the, the connection between media and, and, and politics. And, and governance. And uh, we're very happy to have her here to talk about, uh, and, and again, so now she's moving to thinking about uh, social media and, and the internet and how it affects uh, politics and, and government. And so we're very happy to have her here to talk to us about uh, 3G internet and conference and government. Uh, so uh, so Katarina, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll pass the floor to you, but but just to, to, to let people know about the, the organization. So. If you have any questions uh, throughout the talk, feel free to send them to me in the chat, and then I'll uh, uh, I'll pass them through to 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 Katya. Um, so uh, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you very much uh, for the organization uh, of this wonderful conference and for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm just only sad that uh, it's not in person. So this is joint work with uh, Sergey Guriev, who is in Sciences Po, and Nikita Melnikov, who is a grad student in uh, Princeton, and he, he will be on the market next year. And even though my keynote will be based on a, on a paper, I will try to be so at least a li little bit less rigorous and maybe open up a little bit more compared to the normal uh, paper presentation. And let me start with a very simple observation, which probably one doesn't even need to mention in this particular audience, but generally it's, uh, it's uh, in use to quite a lot of people, which is that in the last uh, decade, we have seen the ICT revolution, which has to do with the vast increase in broadband internet access across the world. And uh, that probably most people know, but not most people know, uh, not all people know that uh, it has been due to the expansion of mobile broadband internet. And by mobile broadband internet, what I mean is uh, 3G mobile technology and higher, 3G, 4G, and you know, the coming 5G. And here, what I just show is uh, the expansion of the total broadband internet access and uh, separately broken by mobile and fixed. And you, as you can see, fixed really did not contribute to the, this global expansion. Moreover, and perhaps a little bit more surprisingly, it is true both for developed and developing countries, in particular in developed countries where we are usually thinking about internet as something which uh, usually comes with optic fiber, the expansion of uh, internet uh, broadband uh, has been tremendous and also was due to the mobile internet, to 3G. And uh, I should say also that uh, the implications of 3G go well beyond just broadening broadband internet access. In particular, uh, 3G was the key driver of a rapid expansion of social media. And uh, the reason for this is that it was the first generation of mobile technology which uh, allows uh, users to freely um, transfer um, images and even more important, freely stream and upload videos. And both of these features were absolutely instrumental for the development of uh, uh, social media. Uh, and here, I just show you that indeed there was a really, really huge uh, increase in uh, uh, particularly uh, use of Facebook and YouTube, but other social media platforms as well, which coincided with 3G. It is important to note, of course, that social media appeared before 3G, but the reason why it thrived and expanded so much was precisely this new technology, which allowed people to just post stuff they, which they see right, right on the spot. So therefore, I would like just to right away argue that 3G not only changed how much time we spend online, not only just uh, increasing access, but what we do online. And social media, of course, is the key to this. And uh, given this uh, ICT revolution on the background, there has been a 
public debate and debate uh, among political uh, scientists and political economists about what are the political implications of the expansion of mobile broadband uh, internet around the world. And uh, broadly speaking, there are two views of this uh, phenomenon. On the one hand, uh, starting with the Arab Spring, uh, there is a bunch of people who are very optimistic about uh, the uh, new social media role in uh, um, politics, particularly internet has been branded and social media have been branded uh, liberation technology. And there are very good reasons for this, in particular, uh, social media and internet do improve uh, informativeness of the voters in those places where there are no uh, independent of the government political uh, sources of information. And even more importantly, perhaps, social media, because it is a two-way information flows technology, it allows coordinating when uh, people, for example, want to stage a protest. So all of these uh, seem to be important ever since the, the Arab Spring uh, has, uh, has started the wave of protest which uh, spread across the globe. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, however, uh, pessimists consider both uh, social media and internet uh, media more generally as misinformation technology. And we all, of course, know that these debates uh, very well. Why would that be the case? Well, again, for very good reasons. First, uh, it may uh, facilitate dissemination of fake news. Uh, it uh, may empower non-democratic regimes uh, by reducing costs of surveillance and propaganda. Uh, they also help populists to connect to voters through social media, as we have observed well in the, in the last few days as well as uh, uh, over a longer period of time. So when we look at this debate from the academic uh, perspective, uh, actually these conjectures have found very nice uh, and very solid empirical support in a number of single country studies, uh, which uh, look at uh, various cases and identify them well. And here, I would like to just uh, take an opportunity to uh, advertise uh, a review which uh, I wrote jointly with Maria Petrova and Ruben Inkalopov, which, uh, which has come out uh, last year in Annual Review of Economics, which summarizes all of this literature. Yet, it seems that uh, one country study perspectives are, are losing something because we really are thinking about a global phenomenon. And to illustrate to you that this is a global phenomenon, I would like to quote from a very nice book called The Revolt of the Public, uh, written by Martin Guri, who is a former CIA analyst. And he's very much in interested in uh, the political effects of social media and internet. And he writes, I quote, the rise of Homo informaticus, a person relying on social media for information, places governments on a razor's edge where any mistake, any untold event can, uh, can draw networked public into streets. This is uh, the situation today for authoritarian governments and liberal democracies alike. The crisis in the world concerns the loss of trust in government in general. The greater the diffusion of information to the public through social media, the more illegitimate any political status quo will appear. It poses an existential challenge to the legitimacy of every government, and I should add the legitimacy of democracy as well. So uh, this quote from Martin Guri really is at the core to, of what we are doing in this paper and what we are trying to understand in this paper. In particular, uh, this paper tries to look at the global perspective. So we would like to try to document political effects of the expansion of mobile broadband internet across the whole world. And in order to do this, we are combining two sources of data which cover the whole world. One is uh, the uh, data on the expansion of 3G internet. And uh, that uh, uh, we have at a very, very high resolution. And we have that for the whole decade, basically, last decade. And uh, we merge that data to the survey data on attitudes towards government, which come from the Gallup World Poll for the same uh, 
time period, and I'll talk about the data more, but I should say that here we have only localization at the subnational level, but it's still uh, not bad. And we, it allows us to do uh, quite a bit, as hopefully I will convince you. So, and then finally, we uh, try to understand what are the electoral implications of uh, the uh, 3G expansion on democracies. What's important here is that the global setting allows us to shed light on at least some of the mechanisms at play because we are able to compare the effect of 3G on government approval across different institutional environments. And that's something which uh, can't be done with single uh, country studies. And let me right away, given that time is short, give you the few takeaways. Uh, first of all, we do find that access to 3G internet significantly and strongly decreases government approval on average. And there is very important heterogeneity, which points to the fact that it is the content which is available on the internet, which, which uh, uh, does the job, particularly it's the availability of independent of the government political information, which is definitely one of the channels at play. And importantly, it's not all about fake news. Some of this information is accurate. And we show that internet helps to expose actual corruption. And finally, we also uh, obviously know that fake news uh, 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 do circulate on uh, social media, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit too. But overall, let me just, uh, before we dive into uh, the story, uh, tell you that we also show that in Europe, and that's where we, we have data on, on elections, we also find electoral implications. In other words, we see that incumbents lose votes with the expansion of uh, 3G. And um, overall, from psychologists, we do know that one story is more persuasive than statistics with uh, 1 million observations. I'm going to show you some statistics with 1 million observations uh, uh, as we go along. But before, I would like to start with three stories, which basically give uh, us a picture of what are we talking about? What should we expect from the data? So the first story is the story of uh, the triumph of this gentleman who, whom you see on the slides. This is Klaus Ioannis, who is a Romanian president who will be remembered in history books as a Facebook president. And in particular, he won for, for the first time presidential election in 2014, when he was a complete outsider to politics. He's a former physics teacher. And uh, at the time, and still, unfortunately, Romania is a pretty corrupt country. And it was the second most corrupt country in the European Union after only Bulgaria. And he was campaigning on the anti-corruption ticket and won, and won despite the fact that his campaign was uh, essentially on Facebook. He was really, really not doing anything more than just uh, social media campaigning. And in fact, he himself on the election night wrote a post to celebrate his victory where he said, together, we have won this battle here on Facebook. For the first time, online has made a difference. I'm not sure if it was the first time, but certainly the first time in uh, Romania. And indeed, uh, there are a number of post-election surveys which show that uh, for a large number of Romanians, uh, it, social media played a major role in their decision uh, in these elections. and. Uh, let me just uh, give you a punchline of this story that it seems to be a happy story because Ioannis sticks to his election promises. He tries to fight corruption in Romania from his office. You know, this is a parliamentary democracy, so there isn't really much uh, the, the president can do, but he can do some, and he's, try, uh, he's trying to do this, and he actually got reelected uh, in uh, 2019. So it seems to be a happy story where social media leads to some kind of political change. But unfortunately, it's not always so great as a story. And in order to illustrate this, uh, I would like to uh, uh, give you an example of uh, the story of this gentleman. This is Jair Bolsonaro, who will you know, go down in history with all sorts of different things. But one thing is definitely is important for my story is that his campaign was 100% on WhatsApp. So he also, just as uh, Johannes, was a complete outsider. 
Uh, but unlike Noelis, he, he, as you know, is a right-wing populist. And uh, interestingly, due to the very strict rules on electoral campaigning uh, in Brazil, which very much favor incumbents, uh, he didn't get any access to, to TV. So he had to run fully digital campaign. He didn't choose it. He just didn't have any other choice. And uh, the digital campaign in, in Brazil means that you need to uh, look at uh, the pass uh, find social media which, through which you can reach out to most of the Brazilians. And the only social media like that is WhatsApp. Why? Because vast majority of Brazilians have the so-called zero ra rating mobile plans, which do not allow free access to, to internet or doesn't, don't allow access to many of the social media apps, just because these are much cheaper plans. And uh, that's uh, most of them, like almost all of them have WhatsApp. So what Bolsonaro did, he ran a com campaign on WhatsApp with uh, a lot of his supporters who penetrated the, the groups because the WhatsApp communication goes through the limited groups to about 300 people in, with the encrypted chat, uh, chats. And what's important about his story is that uh, apart from the completely legitimate criticism of entrenched elites, he also disseminated, he based his campaign on disseminating false stories about incumbent. And uh, there's quite a lot of observers who, who showed that in Brazil, these fake news about incumbents were decisive for the, uh, for the results of this uh, election. And indeed, Bolsonaro won the second round uh, with 55% of the vote. And uh, interestingly so, if you just look at the uh, data on micro, micro regions in Brazil and look at the results of Bolsonaro's victory, you see that there is a very strong cross-sectional correlation between the Bolsonaro's vote share and the share of micro regions territory covered by 3G. And it's particularly surprising given that mobile internet coverage is much higher in Brazil in more developed areas and more urban areas where a priori, uh, it is much less likely that people would vote for a populist right-wing candidate. So again, the story is that uh, mobile internet and WhatsApp in particular played a very important political role, but this time maybe not as uh, positive as my, in my first story. And the third story would like to highlight the fact that uh, the effects which we are looking at are not just limited at uh, democracies. In particular, we can think about examples when exposing corruption or in autocracies also plays a role. Uh, of course, there are no free elections in autocracies, so autocrats cannot just uh, lose power in elections yet, still they can be affected by what's going on social media. And here is my example of uh, uh, the screenshot from a uh, documentary, which was in Russia only available on YouTube, which was done by the uh, leading opposition, uh, uh, or a leader of the opposition, I should say, in Russia, Alexei Navalny, who is now, uh, world famous, of course, which exposed corruption of the former Russia's prime minister and before that, uh, quote unquote, president Dmitry Medvedev. Uh, and uh, that uh, um, documentary essentially led to a very sharp uh, and unexpected fall in rate rankings of Dmitry Medvedev and eventually forced his res resignation. So that video was uh, watched uh, by 20 million in the first week after it was, uh, it was um, uh, posted. And uh, as of yesterday, this film was watched by almost 40 million people on YouTube which is uh, quite a big reach out. And it's very important that uh, not a word about this was out in any of the traditional media. So these stories basically just highlight that we should expect some effect of uh, uh, mobile broadband internet arrival. And let me now come to what we actually do in this paper. Uh, in particular, the central uh, outcome variable, which we're looking at, uh, comes from the Gallup World Poll, I already said that, 
And uh, this is a survey of about 1 million people. Uh, and uh, in over 120 countries of the world, they ask a series of the same questions about uh, people's attitudes towards the government, to the, towards the incumbent in, their particular, in, in each of their particular countries. Uh, in particular, the, the questions concern are, are, the, are the following. Do you have confidence in uh, the national government, in the judicial system and courts in your country? Do you believe in honesty of the elections in your country? Do you think that corruption is widespread throughout the government in your country? And for all of these questions, you, you only have a binary answer, yes or no. So we cannot look at the degree of uh, uh, the um, dissatisfaction of people, but we can see the majority opinion, basically, the overall government approval rankings. And this information is available at uh, the individual level with the subnational region uh, localization. So we know which subnational region, usually it's a NATS2 level, where, where the respondent lives in each of these countries. And we merge these data to the data on uh, the 3G network coverage by year from 2007 up until the 2000, 2018. And in this particular map, we just highlight the fact that uh, uh, in, at the beginning of our study in 2007, there was almost no uh, 3G coverage in the world. And uh, if we jump 10 years later, you see with these uh, dark uh, color, we indicate the um, uh, 3G coverage. So starting in our, in our uh, uh, first year of our observation uh, of, of, of our sample, there was only 0 0.4 active mobile broadband subscriptions per capita. And by 2018, there were 0 0.7 uh, broadband subs uh, mobile broadband sub subscriptions per capita, which is a big expansion. On top of that, uh, this uh, map highlights the sample of countries. So our sample, when we merge the two data sets, uh, uh, is comprised of 116 countries and uh, 2,323 subnational regions. And just to show you the size of the subnational regions, we can see that on these maps with this, uh, I don't know how visible it is for you, but, but uh, you can see that uh, we, we, we look at within country uh, uh, localization. Uh, however, you know, there are some important countries which unfortunately are not in our data set. Uh, for example, neither in China or in Iran, Gallup World Poll is allowed. So we, we cannot uh, uh, do that analysis there. So with this data, what do we do? We basically do a very, very simple thing. The first empirical exercise is just a standard difference and difference uh, um, uh, regression, let's say, where we look at how government approval changes with the arrival of mobile internet into subnational regions, taking into account other factors that can affect government approval, such as economic development, demographics, education, income, uh, and uh, region and year fixed effects, and also, you know, in some specifications, regions by year fixed effects. So we are just basically trying to partial everything, all the pot potential confounds uh, out, and then see what the relationship is. And I can uh, basically uh, illustrate this relationship with one graph. Even. And that's uh, the graph which you see in front of you, where on the vertical axis, we plot the government approval on average, net of all controls, which I just uh, listed. And on the horizontal axis, we plot an increase in the subnational regions 3G coverage. And by 3G coverage, uh, I mean the percentage of population who, who lives in areas which are covered by uh, by 3G. And what we see is that as uh, 3, 3G expands into the region, the government approval falls. And here it's just essentially raw data net of controls where the dots illustrate the equal size means by equal size means. Okay, so these are these 1 million observations which uh, I mentioned before. But to be more precise, let me give you the, uh, the actual estimates of uh, uh, which come from this analysis, and I illustrate them in this graph. 
Here, uh, the dots are the uh, point estimates of, of the government approval, and there are several characteristics which we're looking at. The confidence in government, confidence in the judicial system, honesty of elections, the belief that there is no corruption in government, and the overall government approval, which is the uh, aggregate of the other uh, four, which is actually the first principal component of them. So the blue dot is uh, what the average level of all of these uh, measures is before the arrival of 3G to your average region across the globe. And uh, the red dot is what happens after the region gets covered fully with the 3G. Uh, and maybe it's worth noting that the rectangular shapes, they show the confidence intervals. So, so essentially what we see is that there is a pretty large decrease in confidence in, in government. And particularly if we look at the government approval overall, the magnitude of it is uh, 5.7 percentage points, which is quite a lot given that it starts at about uh, 40, 46, 47 percent of people approving their government in an average region, an average country, okay? And interestingly, so the effect is even bigger for rural residents. So here we are talking about the magnitude of about eight percentage points. So we jump from zero to a hundred percent increase in 3G. It's worth noting that uh, the standard deviation is about half of that actually. So it's not true that everywhere we see uh, over the period of uh, 10 years in which we, which we, in which we look at where that everywhere the jump is, uh, is uh, all 100%, but yet it's, uh, it is pretty large. So the question then uh, which I'd like to address is, uh, you know, first, what is this, uh, should we believe this relationship? Is this relationship causal? In other words, uh, could it be that the expansion of 3G networks is driven by a change in, let's say, government approval or in some other factors which are related to, to government approval? And uh, the answer, of course, is yes, it could be, but it's unlikely for a number of reasons. And uh, in particular, one reason which we highlight uh, is uh, that uh, we can, we can look at the dynamics of government approval around the sharp changes in uh, regional 3G coverage. Generally, most of the time, the 3G coverage in increases gradually. So we, of course, identify the effect from differential increases in different places, but we would like to see what happens if suddenly you know, 3G gets installed in the whole region. And how do we do this? We define a sharp increase as more than half of the population of a region, of a subnational region, which suddenly gets 3G in one year. And by definition, it could only happen once in history, if, if it happens at all. And it turns out that there are 452 regions uh, in 62 fund countries where we can observe that. And that gives us the possibility to see if there's anything going on before this uh, uh, arrival of 3G to region uh, happens. And in particular, this gray uh, line basically illustrates the, this event, the, the, the experiment which we're looking at here. So what happened with 3G coverage before this sudden increase and after. And we see that nothing was happening before, nothing is happening after, and, and this one event happened in one year suddenly. So what we'd like to see is what is the dynamics in government approval, and that's what we show in this blue uh, schedule. In particular, we see that there are no pre-trends, so it doesn't seem like there was anything going on before the technology was installed at the region. And, and uh, right after it was, government approval falls and it stays uh, low and actually even increases with, with time. Of course, uh, nowadays, you cannot just show the results of diff and diff without uh, understanding that if it's a staggered treatment, you need to use a robust estimator. And for those of you who, who are concerned about this, here is the schedule, the same uh, estimates, but using the uh, estimates of uh, the Chesman-Martin and Othoy, which understand that there could be some negative weights when you have a staggered treatment and you get exactly the same picture. So this event study analysis is a, is a 
is something which helps us to uh, make sure that it doesn't seem like there's other confounding factors around the same time with the exp expansion of 3G. The other very important question which we need to think about is that, could it be that it's not about more uh, broadband mobile technology? Could it be that it's any ICT technology when it arrives, then it somehow is uh, related to uh, government approval or dynamics in it? And in order to do this, we look at the uh, placebo using the expansion of 2D, 2G technology. Uh, the second generation. And the second generation compared to third generation is the one which allowed uh, SMS, it allows texting, but it doesn't allow broadband internet access. And what we see using 2G, and this is a graph for our estimates of for what's happening uh, when 2G arrives uh, to a subnational region, we see that the effect, not always significant, but it is actually reversed. So with the arrival of 2G in the region, the government approval increases. So, so that, that uh, uh, actually means two things for us. One is that uh, we are, you know, our effect is really about broadband internet, which is mobile rather than any ICT technology, because the expansion of 2G actually followed the same rules as the expansion of 3G, but a little bit uh, earlier. But second, what's important is that uh, there is another paper, which is an excellent paper, which is now forthcoming in Kinemetrica by uh, Monacord and Tesse, who look at Africa, African continent, and who show that uh, 2G is associated with the higher uh, incidence of protests. And uh, here it is important to compare the results of this analysis and the results of Monaco that they say to really understand what's going on. So basically, indeed, 2G was enough to help uh, essentially minorities who are usually staging protests to organize and sometimes also to get informed. But it took social media and the next generation of uh, uh, mobile technology for that uh, discontent with the government to spread to the majority of the population. So it is, it is very important that uh, uh, what we're looking at here is just average ranking for the, for the average, or average voter. And that's not the person who usually participates in protests. So, however, in order to completely nail causality, we need an instrument, of course. Uh, in particular, we need to find a factor that affects 3G expansion uh, and is not sure is, is sure not to affect uh, uh, government approval other than through 3G expansion. And we what we use is uh, uh, the frequency of lightning strikes, which uh, uh, usually cause power surges, and therefore they substantially increase costs in uh, providing. Uh, mobile um, services, and therefore they may hinder rollout of telecommunication technologies. And that instrument actually was also used by an accord and TSA for Africa. And just for you to illustrate uh, that indeed frequency of lightning strikes is a very important predictor of the speed of 3G expansion, particularly in those places where there's no power surge protection technology easily available. I can show you this graph where we look at the the rollout of 3G in uh, regions with low and high frequency of lightning strikes per square kilometer in the same countries. So I keep the set of countries uh, the same where you have uh, uh, both, both types of regions and you see that in places where there's no, uh, the lightning strikes frequency is low, that's where 3G rolls out much faster. And what we see overall, and this is uh, now we can look at the dynamics of government approval in regions with high and lower uh, lightning frequency. What we see is that indeed in only in those regions where frequency of lightning strikes is low, that's where government approval has, has declined. And of course, we do the rigorous analysis with the second stage and we confirm our estimates, which I showed you earlier, using just a simple different diff. So now let me... Um, come maybe to a more interesting part of, uh, of the story to try to understand what is going on. 
And the first thing we want to understand is whether it is indeed the content which is available online, which is behind our, our estimates. And in particular, when we think about it, if 3G provides citizens with negative information on government performance, and it, it, in this particular case, it doesn't even matter whether it's real or fake, then we should expect two things. One, we should expect that the effect should be weaker if the internet content is censored, and the effect should be stronger if alternative channels of information, for example, traditional media are censored. And that's exactly what we find. In particular, uh, here we just split uh, all our 116 countries into two groups, the countries which do censor internet. And it turns out that there are quite a lot of those countries, particularly in uh, uh, Asia, but also a bit in Europe and, and in Africa and the countries which do not sense the internet. And we see that all of this, our average negative effect comes uniquely from the countries where, uh, where, this sense, uh, where the content of the internet is not censored. And there, we, we see absolutely nothing for the countries with uh, censored internet. At the same time, if we focus on those countries which do not censor internet, there is a uh, very important heterogeneity with respect to how free the traditional press is, how much of the information is available for other channels. In particular, if we split the countries with, which have free internet into those with above and below median censorship of the traditional media, we see that the effect is stronger, in other words, steeper in places where traditional media is pro-government. It's not uh, independent of the government. It's worth maybe noting that actually it's technically and for sort of logistics reasons, it's much easier to censor traditional press than the internet. In particular, most of the ownership of traditional press in the world is very concentrated. So it's much easier for the governments to, to, to control it. So with this, let me uh, try to understand uh, a little bit. So what does it mean? So, so uh, why would negative information about the government actually affect uh, government approval? So uh, on the one hand, of course, uh, indeed elites may control traditional media in many countries and in every country in particular. And this means that uh, pre-mobile uh, uh, broadband internet uh, may be the view of the uh, median voter and the average voter was too positive of the government because they just didn't know about corruption scandals and didn't know about the, uh, the, all the uh, negative things about the government, which means that this uh, positive bias get, would be corrected with 3G. That's of course a very um, positive view of what's going on, but one could think about a different view, which is that uh, actually it could be that the bias uh, is uh, rather coming with 3G. In particular, you know, we know very well, and uh, the quote from, from um, Martin Buri actually talks about this, that social media is more prone to disseminating negative messages. And in particular, the whole um, uh, business model is based on engaging the viewers and engaging viewers with negative emotions is usually much, users, I mean, uh, with, with, uh, is much simpler than engaging them with uh, uh, positive emotions. And we do see indeed that uh, negative messages disseminate faster and deeper than, than positive ones. So if that's the case, then that would mean that uh, with the arrival of pre-G, there is a bias in public opinion towards uh, being focused on more negative things, right? And indeed, social media were called outrage machines, right? Machine by, by many observers. Yet, irrespective of whether which, which of these stories is, is true, and actually, in fact, probably both of these stories are true to some extent, you know, if the government is super clean, think about, let's say, Denmark on, or Sweden, uh, Switzerland, uh, then uh, it's not clear why we would expect a negative effect of 3G, right? We would expect it to be on average negative, but not in all countries. 
particularly even if in Denmark people read on social media something bad about their government, they also have a possibility to read about other countries and then they would learn that the actually situation in other countries is much worse, right? So, so that may actually lead to an improvement of uh, the confidence in the own government. And the question is whether it's the case or not. And indeed, it turns out that in the super clean countries like uh, Denmark, Germany, Japan, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, and uh, New Zealand and the United Kingdom, the effect on average is positive. So, so then if you expand the, the uh, set of countries uh, further, then you don't get that anymore. And in, particularly in this slide, what we show is the average effect of the expansion of 3G on various measures of government approval by groups of countries where we split all these uh, 120 or so countries into 14 equal size groups by the overall corruptness level. And we see that for the least corrupt countries, it's consistently uh, positive. And it's not positive for anybody else. In fact, when you enlarge this group of clean countries up until including US, it immediately becomes negative. So, so before US, it seems like you could, you know, uh, uh, try to tease out these positive effects. So, so far, what I told you is uh, about uh, so this evidence seems to point out uh, very strongly to the idea that it's the content which is available online about the incumbent governments which uh, seem to be driving this effect but i told you absolutely nothing about whether this content is accurate or not and we're in particular very interested in whether uh, internet actually helps to expose actual corruption in government and then to do, in order to do this, we use two measures of actual corruption. And both are quite interesting. The, the first measure comes from the wonderful work by Fuseri and others who uh, read through the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit reports and, uh, and basically collect data on corruption incidents. Uh, so we use these data, this is a panel at country level, and we uh, try to look at the following uh, experiment, let's say. Suppose that there is a corruption incident which comes, uh, which suddenly happens in the country. We would like to know how that corruption, actual corruption incident translates into the perceptions of corruption in government, depending on whether uh, the people live in places where, where 3G is available and or, or where 3G is not available. And this is what I summarize on this uh, very, very simple graph. We see that when a uh, corruption incident happens, that leads to a decrease, significant and large decrease in the belief that there is no corruption in home government in regions which are covered by 3G and much smaller and insignificant uh, uh, decline in this belief in regions which are, which are without 3G, which actually strongly suggests that 3G is important in delivering this message to the population. So what we also do, we use another measure, which uh, unfortunately available is only at, as a cross section, but it certainly was a, uh, a surprise measure. So that comes uh, of, of actual corruption. That comes from the revelations from Panama Papers. Many of you remember that in April 2016, we learned about the offshore accounts of many of the uh, people in governments in, in different parts of the world. For example, it led to the dismissal or uh, res resignation of the Islamic prime minister, for example, but uh, there, are, there were many other stories as well. So we use Panama Papers as a measure of this news about actual corruption. And we again see that this news led to a much bigger and uh, more significant decline in the belief of that there is no corruption in government for those places where, the, of course, these, these were the revelations of true corruption. Uh, compared in regions with 3G compared to regions without 3G. So again, what we see is that when there is real corruption, 3G helps expose it. Uh, of course, this is not the full story and uh, the story of uh, Jair Bolsonaro definitely illustrates that. And I have uh, 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 
I would like to mention it right away. So the other important question to understand is, you know, could it be something else about social media which we're, which we're picking up? In particular, you know, in the age of social media, when we spend so much time online, people may get just depressed, generally may, be get, may get isolated. It's hard to think about this now in the age of lockdown because of the COVID, but we were isolated even before that because of, the so, of social media. So, so then we would like to, we, we need to, be sure that uh, our effect on the government doesn't come through the general effect on unhappiness or, or uh, let's say, uh, less of a um, uh, positive outlook for the future. And what we do for this, we use uh, the different uh, measures of life satisfaction and the, uh, the expectation for the dynamics of life satisfaction of people for the future uh, and we see that there's absolutely no effect on any of these characteristics uh, uh, from the expansion of uh, 3, 3G. So, which means that this is really truly the political effect which matters. It's not just the, uh, some kind of implication of the overall uh, decline of unhappiness. So with this, let me uh, very, very quickly um, go through the other part of the analysis which we do in the paper, which try to ask the question, what are the electoral implications of this in democracies? So we have basically, I hope I have convinced you that there, 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 was, there is a disillusionment with the government in general, which is caused by the expansion of 3G. But you might want to ask, so what? Is it, is it real? Does it have real effects? And for that, we unfortunately need to uh, scale down our operation. And instead of looking at the whole world for the, for the uh, uh, because of the reasons of data availability, we look just at Europe. So we look at full set of European democracies in the same uh, decade, which we've studied uh, already. So, and we look at all parliamentary elections happening uh, uh, in these uh, 33 countries, which uh, altogether are 102 parliamentary elections. And we look at data again at the subnational uh, sub level. And uh, uh, it, it so happens that uh, the time under study coincides with a pretty large increase in, in uh, uh, the popularity of populist parties in, in Europe. And uh, also uh, not only the increase in popularity, but actually rise to power of populists in many of the European countries. So we also like to know whether these phenomena are related. Just uh, before I uh, come to showing you results, uh, I would like to also highlight the fact that even in Europe, you know, in the, in the, pretty, in the European democracies, which are very developed uh, uh, countries, during, during this decade under study, there was a very large expansion, most of the time, not from zero, but still a uh, very large expansion of uh, uh, 3G. So we have quite a lot of variation in the data to be able to estimate this. With this, we ask the question, so are the incumbents hurt by 3G? And the answer to this is definitely yes. So here I illustrate again our main result where we plot the vote share for the incumbent. Uh, as a function of increase in 3G coverage at some national level in these countries. And we see that these disillusionments overall with, uh, with the government translates into lower vote shares for the incumbents. The next question is who gains? And I'm aware of the fact that I need to wrap up soon to be able to, uh, uh, find, uh, to leave time for the discussion. So let me be very quick. We, uh, we, we, we try to understand what kind of position gains uh, uh, from the expansion of 3G. And what we find is that it's in particular populists, both on the right and on the left of the particular, so of the, of the uh, political spectrum who gain from uh, the expansion of 3G. And non-populist opposition, there is no effect. And if we, for example, focus on green parties, which are also anti-establishment parties, but not populists, you also still have absolutely no effect. However, importantly, if we look at 
subset of European democracy where populists actually already are in power, we see that the populist incumbents are also hurt by the criticism of the government online. So 3G leads to de decline in vote shares for the populist incumbents. And that means that with the sto our story is not about populists, right? It's, our story is indeed about loss of trust in incumbents, populist or not. At the same time, it is interesting why uh, populist opposition gains. And here, unfortunately, we can't say much because it could be both uh, coincidental and causal. So on the one hand, it could be that 3G expansion coincided with the time when populist message resonates the most with the voters. But it could also be the case that the, some um, political messages of opposition are better suited for format of social media than others. In particular, populist messages are simpler, uh, they blame someone else with uh, with the um, uh, with with the problems. They blame elite, uh, where, while for example, green parties they ask voters to take responsibility. So it might be uh, much more complex and more difficult. So we don't know why uh, populist opposition uh, games, and this is the we think a very important avenue for future research. But nonetheless, we are pretty confident that uh, what we see is that indeed the expansion of access to mobile broadband internet is what reduces government approval and reduces votes for the incumbents. And let me just uh, stop here so that we have uh, time for discussion. Thank you very much.